We are going to talk today about EICU, the Apollo story. It's an application of what Seattle just talked about and an application of what Alex was mentioning. Uh, as always, let us pray to the gods of technology that this presentation works. I generally like to try a few tricks and experiments on my audience. You're my guinea pigs today. So let's see if all those transitions and all that work. So I'm a critical care and pulmonary specialist. I take care of patients who are trying to die and trying to get them not to die. And one of the things we decided to do a few years ago is to try to get critically ill patients remotely monitored through the Apollo system. Let's take the case of Mrs. Leela. She's a 45-year-old agricultural worker in the farmlands of Telangana, where I come from, Hyderabad. <clears throat> she rolls BDs. She's got a significant uh, burden of illness because she has asthma. And one day, she gets short of breath. She goes to a nearby doctor. He gives her a tablet. Doesn't get better. Six hours later, she goes to the local hospital. They admit her and say, you need IV drips. 12 hours later, she's still short of breath using inhalers, nebulizers, not better. They have to transfer to the big city. She begins her journey in an auto rickshaw, which is a small vehicle, transfers over to a bigger car. Six hours later, she's dead, 200 kilometers from the nearest hospital. 45-year-old, mother of two children, productive member of her family, dead from an asthma attack. This is the reality of India today. The cost of critical care in India is unreasonable. 17,000 rupees is the survivor cost for every person who survives a critical illness. 40% of people sell their assets, sell their homes. 2.2% of people are driven to poverty from critical illness. As mentioned earlier, there's about 5 million ICU admissions, only 70,000 beds. Sometimes you wonder, are we all on the same planet? This is not Neptune, this is just the Pacific Ocean. And we wonder, where does the other half of the world live? The care matrix, as Seattle mentioned, older patients, more patients, less doctors. Everybody wants excellent care. Right now, we are not even able to give adequate care. Dr. Abdul Kalam, in his wonderful expositions in the past, has told us that the youth of India are the ones who are going to move things forward. And technology can be used to actually improve health care. When you move from health to critical illness, how do you break that continuum? You need an expert who uses evidence based on data and communication. Many of these themes have been touched upon already. And if you really look at the state of the Indian ICU, we have critical illness, tropical disease, seasonal disease, trauma. It's dangerous to drive on Indian roads. That is the truth. If you're going interstate, intercity, your chances of dying are high. It's not because drivers are bad, it's just that it is difficult to get to the nearest hospital despite all the advances we have. And this is the same situation all over the world in rural communities. I lived in the US for 15 years, moved back to India about six years ago, and I lived in a small town in North Dakota which had 2,000 people, one traffic light, but patients were saved because they had a system of communication, helicopters, ambulance, etc. Roads were good. So this is the kind of network which we don't have yet. Luckily, we have things which are happening in the right direction. This is still the biggest enemy of the world. It's not big bombs or nuclear weapons. This little mosquito kills more people than we think of. We have safety in the air. You know, I just came on this flight and, you know, I was, I'm here. It was pretty safe. I didn't know the pilot. I didn't, the pilot didn't know me. The pilot didn't know the air traffic controller. He didn't know who was running the airport lights but we landed safely, we took off safely. A million flights are going on the air right now. When this can happen in the air, why not on the ground? Are there solutions? Sometimes you have to look at things upside down. Sometimes you look at things differently. Can we actually come up with a way to save lives, especially of critically ill patients? Dr. Pratap Reddy on the left, and the god of Apollo on the right. A lot of similarities. Apollo is the god of medicine and also the god of prophecy. Dr. Pratap Reddy actually envisioned and told us, we need to get critical care and health care to the poorest person anywhere in the world. And that is a mission statement for this hospital system. And what I'm going to share with you is something we're trying to do to actually divide and make, break the divide. In 2013, we decided that we should try to get tele-ICU and we decided to do EICU. You'll see what it is shortly. In 2014, we had several challenges, technology challenges, cost challenges, it's like giving an iPhone to somebody who does never seen a phone. 
So you're giving a phone to somebody who's never even spoken on a phone before. That's what I'm talking about right now. But human beings adapt to technology really quickly. I'm sure some of you have checked your WhatsApp messages already while I'm talking. How many of you did? Raise your hands. It's okay. You know, if I had my phone, I would do it. So it's, it's, it's you know, second nature to us now. And if in 2015, we had significant growth, we expanded our reach. In 2016, we had streamlining processes, protocols, communication. And in 2017, we right now are actually researching what we did. Very recently at the uh, National Telemedicine Association meeting, we presented our data. Brief thank you to Dr. Ganapati, Mr. Sangeeta Reddy, Dr. Pratap Reddy, Pankaj Gautam, part of our team who are actually helping us take this forward. In 2018, we really aimed to get this to the mainstream and really launch it much more widely. Uh, I'll see if this video works. This is in action, about 30 seconds. We have our uh, nurses sitting in the command center, just like an air traffic control. We have a doctors monitoring patients remotely or 1,000 kilometers away. They can zoom into the ventilator, look at the data on the ventilator. You can actually see what the settings are, give advice to a junior doctor who's probably handled five patients on a ventilator. The guy at the other end has handled 1,000 patients on a ventilator, so he really knows what to do. And if he can't handle it, he calls me, and I've handled 10,000 patients on a ventilator. So it's very easy to take care of a patient way out there who has no resources, because all you need is, do I add salt now? You can ask for a recipe. That's all it takes. And you can look at imaging. You can look at the electronic record. You can look at trends of data. We can even have a dumbed down version where we just talk on the phone, but we can see the patient. India right now, we have several centers. We have about uh, almost 15 centers around the country. Over 200 beds are e-accessible, as we call it. The little picture down there is a very remote area. It takes a patient with malaria 14 hours to reach my city by bus. And sometimes they can't do it because there are political issues going on, the buses are stopped, patients can't get out. So this con uh, company called NMDC actually launched a tele-ICU center in the middle of the forests of uh, rural India. We've been monitoring our data to see what actually happens. We have looked at monitor alarms. We're trying to see what is the data that you're getting from all these remote EICUs. So we are, simplistically put, connected to ele electronically to intensive care units around the country and we have determined that the average length of stay is about less than four days. We get about 15 alarms every hour from these patients. Most of the alarms are for agitated patients, patients with septic shock as well as fast heartbeats. Let me take a few seconds to tell you about septic shock. A little cut on your finger can kill you. 40% of people who get bloodstream bacterial infection don't make it. Luckily, we have better systems now of alerting us about sepsis, better systems of actually taking care of things. Now, this is a technology conference, but honestly, good healthcare is not about technology. It's about communication. It's more about what can we do to convey the knowledge that is required to save a life. Intravenous fluid can save more lives than the most expensive medicine. If you can get a simple antibiotic to a patient within one hour, you're actually going to save more lives than doing anything else. This is just a breakdown of what we are seeing. Unfortunately, we have seen over 200 poisonings, people trying to kill themselves. Very sad, but the reality is several people try to take their lives and they end up in ICUs. They consume tons of resources. It's a social problem. It's not a technology problem. Sometimes you wonder, this is Indian mythology slash religion slash spirituality, you can call it what you want, but we have the god of finance, Lakshmi, and the god of education, Saraswati. Who's bigger, money? Or education? Well, I think education. And we have been taking classes for skill building up of nurses, doctors, junior doctors, people around the country who are at the other end. They come to us for training, we go to them for training, and we teach them the simplest things. There's only six things that actually save lives in critical care. Raising the head of the bed, starting antibiotics early, watching your glucose, making sure you don't get ulcers, making sure you don't get blood clots, and making sure that you make patients turn left and right. Those are the only six things that actually be shown to save lives. It's not high-tech technology, unfortunately, or fortunately. But we are not able to convey that information in an actionable way. And we feel like if we can, on the spot, point of care, educate and disseminate simple truths of evidence-based healthcare, we can make a difference. And we have been seeing that. 
This person there, I don't even know, that's called Narada. He's one of these guys who goes around the celestial worlds, apparently talking and communicating and sending information back and forth. He sometimes spreads truths, sometimes spreads untruths. He's a kind of gossipy kind of guy. But he's a good model for me for communication because he's talking to everybody. Essentially, if you talk more, you have less errors. If you have less errors, you have better outcomes. Better outcomes, lower costs, and improve health. And then you communicate more. And I think it's very critical that we really understand that technology is for human health. Most people who build technology are designing wonderful things. But you need to apply those things. And that's where teleICU makes a difference. Finances, there are startup costs, broadband costs, equipment costs, training costs, business development. We have a revenue model which shares in, uh, money between the hospital, the patient, the tech partner, etc. And ultimately, there are savings for everybody. Sacrifices, I'm you know, not biased to one religion. Jesus died on the cross, so you need to make some sacrifices. What are those sacrifices? You need autonomy. You, need, you, you lose autonomy when you're communicating with somebody. There is sometimes a lack of reciprocity. I can tell them to do something, but they really don't know what they're talking about. There can be ego issues. Doctors are big egos. Surgeons are bigger ones. But you need to really think about how do we actually put neurosurgeons at the top of the line, by the way. But we're not going there. So we lose sleep. We can lack sleep. And of course, you can have non-standard care. Or I can tell them to do something which they don't have. I can tell them to give TPA which they don't have. So I think it's important we realize that we have obstacles to overcome. And the god of obstacles, we invoked earlier, is going to hopefully help us. There are human factors, which are obstacles. There are skill level issues, technology issues. I might have 3G, he might have 4G. Somebody might have no internet. Standards. It might be okay to use a particular medicine which is not correct, but then we have to educate them. And of course, financial barriers, which are actually, I think, the least of the problem. The past is history, the future is a mystery. Today is a gift, and that is why we call the present. And if you look at the Buddha, he said, what next? What comes next? And if you look at it, I think the future of critical care is for everyone, everywhere. I believe that critical care can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be an intensive care unit. I think we will take it beyond India, have rapid deployment, and of course, reimbursement. Let me take 30 seconds to tell you something. I actually do critical care for US patients. There are about 20 Indian doctors around India serving 4,000 ICU beds every day from India for the US. Several hospitals around the US are actually now doing that. I spent 12 hour shifts. They start early, 4 30, 5 30, 6 30 in the morning, take 12 hours. This is, out, this is a separate thing that I do. But we are actually critical care trained. Uh, if you're US boarded, you can actually do that. They have a very advanced system because they have highly skilled nurses and support systems. We have developed a very simple version, and we need to get there. Never stop learning, because life never stops teaching. And I think the reality is that these things keep evolving. And my son reminded me, Dad, if you don't apply what you learned, it's of no use. So really, what we really need to do is to try our best to use technology to develop things. So the EICU story for Apollo is one of really growth. It's of innovation. It's of passion. And really, it's depends on taking the next step because it took a large leap of faith for us to do something like this. It's not been tested before in India. There's only two or three other places actually doing something like this. And very fortunate that the management of the hospital system saw the vision that this is going to actually transform health. Going back to the story of Mrs. Leela, if she had been in New York City, if she had been in Delhi, if she had been in Mumbai, it might not have been a different story. If she couldn't get to the hospital, it might not have been different. But if we can get critical care to the patient, as Shayato mentioned, if we can actually get critical care to the patient at the bedside, we can transform things. The reality is not far away. We are living in it today. Thank you.